Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Bob Iger's return as Disney CEO comes as the company deals with challenges both internal and external. Ahead, the biggest priorities for the comeback king of content. And Genesis is warning of a bankruptcy without new funding as Coinbase hits a record low. The entire industry faces a liquidity crunch. And we've learned U.S. prosecutors opened a probe of FTX months before its collapse. Plus, we'll break down how tech layoffs create a wave of issues for non-U.S. citizens that worked for Silicon Valley giants. But first, Ed, let's check in on these markets. Let's go broader, because overall, there was a little bit of risk aversion in the market. Remember, volumes are low. We have a holiday-shortened week ahead of Thanksgiving celebrations in the U.S. S&P 500, off by four tenths of percent. The technology sector really under some pressure. We're off by more than a percentage point on the Nasdaq. Remember, it's off of their lows of the day, but nevertheless, stress as we see more people focusing on what the Federal Reserve will have to do now to curtail inflation, whether or not they will indeed be hiking rates still at a pace of 50 or 75 basis points as rates go higher. Many feel, of course, the desire to get into tech stocks goes that little bit lower. So money moves out. Crane shares CSI China. Now, interestingly, I've been looking at the ETF that tracks the ETF giants, and actually they had been lower on the day. This is we all look towards not just what the Fed does in the U.S., but, Ed, what is happening in terms of China. COVID outbreaks, once again, deaths. Does that mean that we will see, of course, the curtailment of that economy going forward? China had been trading lower, but this particular ETF at the moment, the China Crane shares one, just flat or up a percentage point at the end of trade. Let's flick it on. Let's look at what's happening cross asset. Let's look at what's happening in terms of Bitcoin. A two day chart here. Look how much has been falling down 6%. We know it's a volatile asset class. But overall, Ed, we want to focus in on what's been happening in the crypto world. Yet further headlines, particularly when it comes to Genesis, just in this hour alone. Yeah, and that crypto contagion also spilling over to the equity markets, Caroline. In particular, Coinbase closing at a record low. Interesting, though, because while that stock is at a record low, uh, we see Kathy Wood and Ark buying 1.3 million shares of Coinbase, buying the dip so far in the month of November, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. Some other movers we're looking at, DraftKings down 5%, users reporting issues with their accounts weighing on the stock. Tesla is now down 25% since October 28th, when Elon Musk closed his deal to buy Twitter. Obviously, some concern that Musk is distracted away from Tesla, but also there is the impact of these COVID shutdowns in China and the question of how that will impact manufacturing at the Shanghai plant. And then Disney. We've got to talk about Disney. Up 6%. Bob Iger is back, Caroline, in the seat as CEO. Bob Chapek has departed the company. There's this amazing price chart, right? You just look at the stock over the last two years and remind yourself about the story behind Disney. Disney Plus launched at the end of 2019. Chapek doesn't even take the helm until the early stages of the pandemic in 2020. And then you have this roller coaster ride with the share price rising to mid 2021 and eventually falling away as we get concerns over subscriber growth and just how expensive the losses are for this streaming business. And then right on the far hand, right, uh, hand side of your screen, Ch uh, Iger is back as CEO. So much to digest with this story. We're going to be focusing so much more, Ed, on what's happening with Disney. But first and foremost, let's get to the breaking news. As Bloomberg's reporting, the digital asset brokerage, as you just said, Genesis, struggling to raise fresh cash for a lending unit. And it's warning potential investors that it may, we say, may need to file for bankruptcy if its efforts fail. It's all according to sources. And Shanali Basak is here because she was indeed one of the bylines on the story, one of the key reporters. And Shanali... Talk to us thus far, Genesis coming back and saying, look, this isn't imminent, but they have been trying to raise funds for some while now, right? They have been trying to raise funds for days. Remember, they had halted withdrawals at the lending unit just last week, in the middle of last week. And since then, they have been in talks with investors, including now we're reporting Binance. Now, funding has so far failed to materialize, and they have been warning a group of investors that they may need to file for bankruptcy, certainly at the lending unit, if those talks do not materialize into funding. Now, remember, Genesis is a huge player in the institutional space. Their trading desk has separately reported an exposure to FTX, but we are now starting to see more effects of what has happened here that you could argue was contagion that started back to three arrows, let alone uh, currently when it comes to the FTX debacles. Janali, what's happening behind the scenes? How much cash do, the, do Genesis think they need? Has this happened in the last 24 hours, in the last two weeks? 
what's happening behind closed doors? Days. Remember, they halted withdrawals in the middle of last week, let's say Wednesday, and then they had, over the days after that, started to look for money. The way that my sources describe what was happening was that a lot of these talks really amplified into the weekend. Uh, and again, remember, they, this is still, they have not filed yet. They are not said that they're going to file yet. They have told us on the record, by the way, that they don't have plans to file imminently, and their goal is to resolve the current situation consensually without the need for a bankruptcy filing, but as we know, that this is still a huge risk. Now, remember, Ed, there are benefits to bankruptcy as well. It would contain a situation here, and remember, this is part of the broader digital currency emp uh, group empire, where we do not have indications that this is a broader problem when you look at this empire that was built by Barry Silbert. So I think that is a very important part of this story here, which assets within that empire we are talking about and how far that contagion can potentially go as we, uh, as we plan for a potential bankruptcy for this unit. Yeah, just talk to us a little bit about Digital Currency Group as well and the efforts that have already been made by Barry Silbert to, well, prop up that entire industry group because thus far it has been noted that money has been put there to ensure that certainly post Three Arrows, the implications weren't too destructive. It's an important question. Remember, after Three Arrows, a, a part of the empire here was said to have been a, a, a creditor to the Three Arrows group. So why is that so important today? Because as investors look at this asset to the point that you are getting at here is that they do want to entangle the relationship between Genesis lending, Genesis trading, and the rest of Digital Currency Group. Now, remember, the rest of the empire is super important to the crypto space. Mm -hmm. That includes GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, Grayscale as a company. But right now, what we do know, and I would say Eric Balchunas over at Bloomberg Intelligence has been brilliant at pointing this out, the company itself spits off a lot of money based on what they are getting in terms of managing the assets for the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. So uh, that's why, again, it's so important here to say what is revenue generating, what is still okay today, and what parts of the business here are we more concerned about? But then importantly for investors, what is the relationship between all the entities at the end of the day? All right, Bloomberg's Shanali Basak, thank you. Let's turn now to Disney after the bombshell announcement that Bob Iger is coming back to the company. Ross Gerber is CEO and co-founder of Gerber Kawasaki, $2 billion in assets under management and importantly, Caroline, a Disney shareholder. So, Ross, your reaction? Oh, I was so happy. I, I, when I saw the news last night, I, I thought... I was dreaming, and and it was like my dream came true. I, Bob Chapek had, had been running the business into the ground and, and had made some crucial errors in handling some very difficult situations, but it was time to really refocus the business back on creating great content for a reasonable cost. Okay, so, Ross, in terms of your prioritization here, and I want to bring to our audience a poll that we went to Twitter with. I know you're a big player on Twitter with hundreds of thousands of followers, but we've been shining a light on what they think the prioritization should be now. Is it the cost controls? Is it more thinking about content, the streaming perspective at the moment? Is it, Ross, actually, of course, what is the internal management of this business? Because Bob Chapek himself had made some, well, very criticized decision making when it came to the politics within Florida and the, what the company stands for. From your perspective, streaming strategy is number one for our audience right here, right now. Is it number one for you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the streaming business that they've built over the last several years is amazing. And it was really led by Iger at the beginning um, to get into streaming. And, and so they got to this point where they now have hundreds of millions of subscribers, but their losses have ballooned. And I'm not really sure why there was such a lack of focus on the cost controls, especially last quarter, because the rest of the business, like parks and resorts and and, and as well as uh, the hotels and, and the cruise ships, uh, many elements of the business are booming right now and hugely profitable. So we actually expected Disney to beat profits nicely this quarter. And it was like, where did this extra billion uh, spent on on the streamers go? And so, you know, Disney, Disney Plus and, and Hulu have are great assets, ESPN Plus, they're great assets and they've had a lot of money invested, but it's time to make this business profitable and, and, and make sense economically. Ross, let's bring you some of what Bob said in a statement Sunday night when he was named as CEO. First of all, he seems as surprised as the rest of us using the word amazement, but he also talks about these times remain quite challenging, I suppose, referring to macro conditions. You, you talked about profit. Is this just, you can't just turn the tap off. 
and suddenly the losses from streaming go away and everything's dandy. How materially does he fix things at Disney? Well, I think you've got really, I would say, three main issues that Disney faces. So the first, which we've been discussing, is how do we build uh, a streamer with the right economics? And it's actually not that hard because you do have a certain level of certainty of what your revenue is going to be because it's a reoccurring revenue model. So Disney and Apple just recently raised prices on their streamers. So they can pretty well guess what they're going to take in revenue-wise over the next 12 months, and they just need to right-size the budget for it. So that that isn't that big of a deal. You just have to you do the right math. The second thing Disney needs to address is China. This is the really big, difficult challenge that many of my companies are facing, whether it be Disney, MGM in Macau, or Tesla in Shanghai. You know, we're just facing so much uncertainty mm. in the Shanghai park is closed again. And this is a big challenge for them, despite the rest of the park's business doing extremely well. Yeah. And then the third thing is, what are they going to do with their sports business? I personally love the ESPN brand and business, and I think that they need to be deeper in sports and deeper in sports betting. And and if not, just get out of the sports business and, and spin it off or sell the ESPN brand. But I think they need to make a decision on what they're going to do with sports in the future. Now, I, I think Disney should stay in the sports business, but but I think Iger will assess these things and, and make some great decisions. And soon enough, we're likely to see the monetization in some parts of Disney Plus, Ross. I'm interested in the people behind Disney Plus, the executives. I mean, we know that Bob Iger might well be thinking of his LGBTQ plus community and how he responds to them post the politicization of all of that. But talk to us about the executives who are in studio roles. Talk about the people who perhaps were given a backseat under Chapek and how that changes. So this part of Disney was going back to Iger's days when they bought Fox. So when they integrated Fox, there was this like almost a lot of the, the Disney people left and Fox people on the television and the movie side sort of stayed and 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 that's been good, I think, for Disney. But I think Chapek really was not great with talent and I don't think he had any vision for the artists or the artistry part of making the magic of Disney. And that's what Iger has that that is really hard to quantify. So so I think this is like a really big thing is I do think they have great executives managing their businesses, but I think they need some direction as far as content is concerned and, and, and sort of like somebody with taste. And that's what Iger has that Chapek certainly doesn't. But I still think the integration of Disney and Fox in a way is still not 100% complete. And I, and I think there needs to be this finality to it. Ross, did you buy more Disney shares on Monday? Well, you know, I run a public ETF. GK is my ETF, and, and I did buy Disney today, and, and I don't know if that's been actually posted yet. <laughs> um, but um, but it, it, it's posted anyways at 5 o'clock Eastern, so I, uh, markets are closed. So uh, I did buy Disney aggressively today. All right, let's think about the other companies. I think it's wildly undervalued. I think it's wildly undervalued. And, and with Iger back, I, I think it's a whole nother business to look at now. Another business to look at. Twitter, you're an investor in the private entity. Bloomberg reported that layoffs continued Monday, focus on sales and marketing. What do you make of that? Well, I think you're going to see the same thing at Disney. So I think if you look at tech companies across the board, um, Twitter included and probably more extreme than most, is we're seeing this resizing of the tech industry across the entire industry. And, and that's really part of that is from the pandemic boom to now bust. Uh, and now, you know, also just a more realistic view of what uh, costs and content are going to be. Uh, used and achieved, but Twitter was wildly overstaffed, and and now they're going to move to a staff level that's probably wildly understaffed, and then they're going to build, and they're going to build by hiring. So I think people are thinking like, oh, this is going to like be the permanent size of Twitter will be extremely small, and I don't think that's correct. What this is going on is a corporate restructuring where a new culture is being built at Twitter and one that will be much more productive for the company, the users, and its shareholders. Your perspective there, Ross. I'm interested in what, though, might occur with a lack. You say it's wildly understaffed. Are there risks? Are there concerns while it is so? Well, I've been, you know, monitoring Twitter, you know, very closely from my own experiential uh, point of view to see if there has been 
any change. And I've actually would argue that Twitter is better now that Elon's taken over than before. The engagement on Twitter has been off the charts over the last couple of weeks, not to mention all the news and information, but Twitter is still the most incredible source of news besides Bloomberg. When you're looking at Sam Bankman fried live tweeting during his fraud, you know, it's it's only on Twitter. And, and so whether if I want news on Ukraine, I'm sorry, I have to go to Twitter. And so it's a crucially important news and information site and one that Elon is working very hard to protect its integrity. And I think Twitter's as yes. good as ever. Ross, as an investor in Twitter who wants a long term return, one thing you want to see Elon Musk do with the platform. Ad, ad creator. Uh, engagement opportunities. So by adding YouTube and you know these kind of features where creators can get on the platform and make a living, um, we post a lot of video on on Twitter and YouTube, and and everybody has to monetize through YouTube. So I think the creator opportunity on Twitter as a platform is enormous, and I think YouTube should be scared. All right, Ross Gerber, CEO and co-founder of Gerber Kawasaki. Thank you. Coming up. We'll have the latest on the Ticketmaster and Taylor Swift debacle and the DOJ's role in all of this. This is Bloomberg. about Live Nation's Ticketmaster, the system crash that of course dashed the hopes of many a Taylor Swift fan for a concert ticket. Turns out, not long after, the Justice Department started probing into all of this to see whether Live Nation is abusing its power over the live music industry. That's all according to sources. I'm pleased to say Bloomberg Intelligence's Jennifer Ree is here with more on this, Ed, because we want to be discussing with Jennifer the great deck that she put out for Bloomberg Intelligence about, well, actually reminding us, this isn't the first time the DOJ has got interested in what was an M&A done years ago. Jennifer. Yeah, so, you know, this has been going on for a really long time. You know, I think the Taylor Swift debacle kind of brought this to the headlines, but honestly, there have been critics of Live Nation and groups that have called for the deal that was closed in 2010 to be unwound by the DOJ really ever since it closed. And the DOJ started investigating after settling with the companies in 2010, probably as early as 2012, only a few years after they actually were merged, because they believed that they were already violating a consent agreement that they'd signed in 2010. Now, I don't know exactly when that investigation started, but what it ended was in 2019, and the DOJ said, in fact, we do believe they've been violating these terms. They were supposed to behave in a certain way toward venues. They promised to behave in that way, not to force or coerce the venues to use Ticketmaster, allow them to use rivals to Ticketmaster, and, in fact, they've reneged on that. So we're going to enter another settlement with them, and that settlement was signed in late 2019. And now I think what's going to happen is the DOJ is going to look again to see, are they still violating that newer amended agreement from 2019? And are they even doing more in the market that's anti-competitive? Jen, what's the threshold this time around? What is it that they'd be looking for that would be enough for an enforcement action? Uh, you know, that's a good question, and they actually have two different thresholds, because the consent order that they uh, agreed to in 2019 lowered the threshold. This is something Live Nation agreed to for the DOJ to show that they'd been violating that consent order. So if they're trying to show that, hey, they agreed to this, they're not abiding by these terms, we have a pretty low threshold to prove that that's what's happening in court. So that's one threshold. Um, I think this is the kind of proof and evidence that's fairly easy for the DOJ to collect. They just go out and talk to venues and find out what their communications have been with Live Nation and with Ticketmaster. But I think the second thing the DOJ might be looking at is, more broadly, is Live Nation and Ticketmaster entering into exclusive agreements with so many big venues that they're basically blocking out smaller rivals who can no longer contract with those venues because they're exclusive to Ticketmaster. That's a little bit of a higher threshold, uh, something I think they could also prove in court, though. If you are a mar company with market dominance, and it's alleged here that Live Nation does have market dominance, it is illegal to tie up more than about 35 to 40 percent of the outlet. And if that's what they're doing with these exclusive agreements or quasi-exclusive agreements, that would violate the antitrust laws. Jennifer, 2010, when the merger occurred, is a right. long time ago. Yes. 
talk to us about the speed at which any of this could <laughs> unfold. Well, it's really slow. I mean, <laughs> I mean, as you heard, the merger was in 2010. According to the DOJ, when they came out with papers in 2019, the deal had been violated since 2012, right? And they didn't settle until 2019. So these investigations can go for two or three years. But I think that the DOJ investigation that's ongoing now did start a few years ago. You know, I went back and I looked at how often we at Bloomberg Intelligence had published about antitrust problems Live Nation could have. And we wrote in 2018, we wrote in 2019, and we wrote in 2020. So I think it's very possible something could happen next year in 2023, an enforcement action more likely than a settlement. All right, Bloomberg Intelligence's Jennifer Ree, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Caro, our top tech calls of the day. Stay with us for the stocks you should focus on. And as we head to break, let's take a look at Zoom. The stock down almost 5% sorry, in late trading after reporting its slowest quarterly sales growth on record tomorrow. We talked to Zoom's CFO, Kelly Steckelberg, about the company's fight to reverse this slowdown in growth. You don't want to miss it. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our top tech calls. Moffat Nathanson upgrading Disney to outperform, expecting the company to re-examine its streaming strategy after reinstating Bob Iger to the top job. Self-driving tech name Mobileye initiated with a street-high $77 price target at Citigroup. The firm has put a buy rating on Mobileye, saying there's a path to hitting $50 billion of revenue by 2030. And finally, Argus downgrading online and car vending machine company Carvana to sell. The firm says the company will struggle to make a profit as used car prices continue to drop. Those are your top tech calls. Some great ones there, Ed. Meanwhile, coming up, we've got so much more to talk about, about workers in particular. Thousands of them have been laid off by tech giants recently, and hundreds of those are on temporary work visas. Why the clock is ticking for immigrant engineers. And a clarification for our Bloomberg Technology audience. During a discussion on Elizabeth Holmes that took place this past Friday when she was given an 11-year sentence for misleading investors, we want to clarify that we were not trying to imply that WeWork's founder, Adam Newman, had committed any wrongdoing by a comparison made. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Some breaking news, of course, the fallout after the reappointment of Bob Iger at Disney. We understand that at the moment, he's asking Disney managers to reconsider the corporate structure. Already, we've started to see that the distribution chief, Kareem Daniel, is stepping down. We understand, of course, this executive was particularly close to Bob Chapek. So Bob Iger is announcing changes in a company memo as it stands. So Kareem Daniel being the chairman of media and entertainment distribution. We'll continue to bring you all the latest when it comes to Disney and some of the restructuring there. Meanwhile, though, there's restructuring going across technology more broadly. Mass tech layoffs have left hundreds of workers living right here in the United States on just temporary visas with little or next to no time to find another job. And indeed, they have to leave the country. And how could this change the U.S. tech landscape more broadly? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Tech companies rely on the H1 visa for computer engineering talent right from all around the world. The numbers behind this Bloomberg analysis are fascinating. H-1B visas capped at 85,000 per year. This group of six tech companies on your screen are behind 45,000 of them, both new and renewed over the last three years. Just those six names alone. As you can see from the chart, H-1Bs make up a significant, OK, not a majority, but a significant amount of the overall workforce. So to answer your question, if a tech worker is laid off and they have to return home to their home nation as a result of losing their job, there's a cost to the employer that has to be covered for the travel back to that home nation. 
The cost is also a big part of this story, right? Why are layoffs happening? Cost-saving measures is a part of it. H-1B visas also carry higher average pay. Generally speaking, the national average of H-1B in terms of pay, if we bring up that next chart, is around $106,000 per H-1B visa employee. But you look across the tech sector, again, those same six names, that average pushes higher and higher in terms of the salary that an H-1B visa employee can command. And things are changing. Think about all the reporting we've done recently, Caroline, on Twitter, those staff that have been laid off here in the United States, and the reporting that Bloomberg's done about them trying to find new roles, talking with recruiters. I really encourage the audience, go on Bloomberg.com, get your Business Week magazine hard copy and take a look at this story. Fascinating data analysis. And all over LinkedIn, many getting on to communication with the across WhatsApp, using any technology outlet really possible to try and find a new sponsor. Aisha White, Dixon White Chief People Officer and Legal Advisor, can bring us her expertise. She, of course, previously held legal and HR positions at Disney, at WeWork. And Aisha, this is a, a really emotional time for many, the dependency of certain people upon their companies to sponsor them, to let them remain a mortgage payer in the US, their children remain at school here overall, the, com the, the, the building blocks of a life they make. We're hearing that certain companies are taking different ways of supporting them. We know that Meta, for example, trying to find ways to delay some of that uh, overall notification and notice period that people serve. What are the best ways companies can make this transition? I think the best way is to A, be honest about what they can do, what they can fund, and what they can afford right now. I think that if you are on an H-1B visa and you are in the middle of your visa stay, Trying to get on with another tech company would be amazing at this point, although it seems like the largest tech companies are setting for layoff right now. So maybe looking at a smaller tech company that still has a budget and the ability to sponsor. Mm -hmm. But I think from a company standpoint, companies are looking at the talent that they cannot lose no matter what and keeping those people sponsored. And for other people, they are trying to get them an extension for as long as they can because there are so many people who have adjusted their lives, believing that they would be in the U.S. sponsored by an employer. From a more macro perspective, time and time again, everyone's wondered when this is going to show up in the numbers, when the non-farm payrolls are going to show some of the job layoffs that we're seeing in technology. And the response I've been getting is, look, these are very talented individuals who will find it very quick to find another role. Is that the case? Are we awash with jobs at the moment? Because I seem to just hear of job freezes in the tech world. So in the tech world, I think, honestly, 50% of the people who are being laid off will find another job very quickly. What is happening is that there are layoffs and there are a lot of job freezes at this point, even if, and, and it's the holiday season, right? The holiday season is a very, very slow time for hiring all around the U.S. So what we have here is, is two things that are working against people. One is layoff and freezes. The second is the holiday season. But I think even if we look at 2023, once we look at January or February, we're only really talking about 50% of the people receiving jobs again because everyone isn't a software engineer that's being laid off. It is across the spectrum in HR, legal, finance, operations. And so all of those jobs, even though they're in tech, don't necessarily get picked up as quickly. Aisha. Mm -hmm. I want to leverage your professional background, your experience. We've done a lot of reporting here at Bloomberg about what has happened at Twitter, right? Down the road from me on Market Street, people being locked out of the building, the HR department being let go. And so those administering the layoffs, not being sort of qualified HR people. Um, you know, Elon Musk tweeted over the weekend pictures of him working late into the night with this new team of engineers. But what is your assessment of how that process was handled? I want to be completely honest and transparent. This was probably the worst mass layoff I've ever seen in my 20 years of being an employment lawyer. I think, you know, Elon came in as an individual versus a businessman and really looked to take over a company and is using it like it's a toy versus a company at this point. He did not come in and work with the chief people officer, who is the chief people and diversity officer, to determine the skills that he had within the company, the knowledge base he had within the company, so he could really make informed decisions about who to let go and who to stay. And everything is showing that he's let go of people who is he's asking to bring back at this point. I mean, there's so many things that he has done that have been really unfortunate, and it's playing with people's lives. 
their salaries, their medical benefits, and their retirement benefits. I mean, this just kind of goes against everything that we say is in best practice of HR, and it's really unfortunate. On the other hand, Aisha, he does mm -hmm. have a track record of getting the best out of people, especially when they're under duress. Does the end justify the means? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I mean, and I would eat my words in six months to a year if something is different. But honestly, right now he's working with a bare bones crew, a crew that doesn't appear to be diverse, a crew that is looking like they're going to burn out. And honestly, a number of people that I know who have continued with Twitter are looking and they are just looking for their next best opportunity. I think the landscape of employment has changed considerably since COVID. No one wants to work and work until they drop anymore. It is just not that type of employment landscape. Mm. And so I understand that Elon has had people who will stick along with him for this ride for a short duration, but I do not believe that he has created enough goodwill or that he has a good enough reputation, even within Tesla, to bring people from Twitter who had really kind of dedicated their skills and everything to Twitter to bring them alongside what he's trying to do. He's just not communicating enough. He's not really showing the roadmap to everyone. And the things that he's done from laying off people at the top all the way down with no severance, no notice, it's not a way to keep a company going or employee morale. Aisha. It's interesting, just to play devil's advocate here, you say the landscape has changed, but the economic landscape's changing with it. And before, we really had the pendulum swing in the direction of, of talent, of employees. Well, now we've got a slowdown in the economy and people are more fearful of their jobs. Is there a risk here that the focus on diversity, on inclusion, the, the realignment of what we thought our purpose for work was does shift again as we start to get more fearful? I don't think that it will shift. I think that some things will take a pause. I definitely believe that budgets within the DEI space, the budgets within the culture space are going to pause. I think they really are. Because in some companies, they believe that that is a nice to have versus a must have. But in terms of what we need, honestly, from a bare bones perspective, to have a company run, which is top talent, top talent can go anywhere. And the question is, why would they want to work for you? Elon, at this point, is not offering increased salaries, increased flexibility, nothing. He is saying, hey, please buy into this dream that I have of how I can really make Twitter something even better than it already was. And I don't know if he has a lot of people along for the ride. In terms of the other tech companies, there are some tech companies that have really done it right, who are not abandoning DE&I and some of the other things like Stripe. I think that you don't abandon these principles, but sometimes you do need to take a pause budgetarily in order to focus on operations. Okay, Aisha White, Dixon White, Chief People Officer and Legal Advisor, thank you. Now, Bloomberg's Cameron Leach is on the case with the Twitter saga and reported more layoffs today. Cam, what do we learn? Uh, there's been a lot that's been happening over the past 36 to 48 hours for employees at Twitter. Uh, we could say, even from our own reporting, starting off on uh, Sunday, workers woke up to a to a to a, a new calendar invite uh, Sunday morning, and then by uh, midday Sunday, there was an all hands meeting, affecting uh, basically just trying to give a new direction for where Twitter was going to go. By the time it came around to Monday, workers had learned that they'd been fired, they'd been let go, but only until January that they'd get uh, they'll still be paid and considered to be an employee as well too. And more specifically, this affected the sales team. And this came as a complete shock, specifically because the sentiment was that, you know, they had been shielded from some of these layoffs that we had been reporting. Not only have our viewers been watching this, employees at Twitter have been watching our reporting as well, too, because they didn't know what was coming up next. But the whole thought process and the sentiment was that they wouldn't be affected by these layoffs because one thing that Twitter needed was revenue. And the sales team yeah. was the main driving force behind those things. So this came as a complete shock for a lot of workers. Cameron, at the moment, I think at the bottom of the story, it really shows that at one point it was 7,000 workers before Musk. We're now looking at an employee internal count of 2,750. How much is there still to go? How much do we inherently need to support a overall social media empire such as Twitter? There's got to be real concerns here. Yeah, I mean, we've all been, you know, tracking a lot of these, you know, technology companies, these big tech companies, and we know for sure that Twitter has been a revenue-losing uh, company 
for some time now, and they've just had to cut costs. You know, and I, I think they only got down to less than a billion just last year in 2021, and, and that was over. They were losing about more than a billion dollars. So it's so much money that they, they have to cut. And it seems like Elon thinks that salaries is the best way to do that by uh, decreasing his head count. Um, I, I, I think the the wheels are definitely spinning over there. I think nobody knows where this roller coaster is headed next. And everybody's on their toes walking on eggshells. Well, Cam, that's what I wanted to ask you about. You know, you and I and the team, we have heard from a lot of former and current employees, right? A lot of sources inside the company have been confused about what's going on. What is the sentiment among staff that are left at Twitter? Yeah, even for those that are left at Twitter, they, as you know, uh, your guest in the last segment said, they are still looking uh, externally. They're keeping the the training wheels going. Um, because there is no direction, there seems to be a lot of confusion going forward. I spoke to a source earlier today, and apparently there should be a final all-hands meeting uh, happening today that kind of gives the direction of where Twitter 2.0 will be going. And apparently those are the, the just only the staff members that are left and that Elon will be keeping with. But that was supposed to be the thought with the last all-hands meeting. So you never know if this could be the next one, if, if this could be the final one. Um, so you, nobody knows. We're sticking close to the situation, and we'll monitor it on Bloomberg.com as well. Cameron, thank you so much for bringing us your inside track at the moment. Cameron Leach, as always, we thank him. And you, Ed, of course, with all your reporting. Coming up, crypto contagion, it worsens. Genesis warning of a possible bankruptcy. More on that in a moment. This is Bloomberg. Two major Bloomberg scoops in the world of crypto on Monday. Genesis has warned of a potential bankruptcy if it doesn't get funding. And federal prosecutors in Manhattan were already looking into FTX's operation months before its collapse. That according to sources. Luckily, Bloomberg's Shanali Basak is here with all the details. Let's start with that FTX investigation. What do we know about regulators and what they were doing with FTX? Regulators were concerned about the FTX empire. Of course, regulators in the United States would be worries about, <laughs> worried about the FTX empire. I would also say, though, remember, this is all happening. The Bloomberg scoop uh, that we are discussing here is all happening on the back of a lot of dispute here, Ed, between the Bahamas and the United States and bringing Sam Bankman-Fried here to questioning for regulators and lawmakers publicly as we wait to hear what's going to happen with the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee, who also want to bring in Sam Bankman Fried for testimony as well as his deputies. I would say separately, as we think about what's happening with the regulators, tomorrow there's going to be a hearing in a Delaware bankruptcy court starting 11 a.m. And so you're hearing both the, the issues of the FTX empire unravel at the same time as we hear about authorities uh, and their concerns, according to sources, between the links between FTX and Alameda. Let's, of course, go to further links. Let's go to further contagion. Let's go, Shanali, to Genesis right now, because your scoop just before us coming on air, the fact that they may have to fail, file for bankruptcy. The focus right now is this is not imminent and they're looking for other sources of funds. Now, remember, something that's interesting about not just the breaking news that we have today, as well as what we've had, uh, as we've been talking about, U.S. authorities looking at FTX over months, this is just another indication that some of these issues go back many months, mm -hmm. that they go back to Three Arrows, for example, and whoever had a relationship with them. Remember, Genesis is one of those companies that did have links to both Three Arrows and FTX at this point in time. Uh, they were a large creditor when you looked at their relationship to Three Arrows. And now, let's talk about it in the vein of FTX for a second, because we know the trading desk had, uh, had about $175 million tied up with FTX, but the lending business separately has had to ha pause withdrawals. So here come the questions. Mm -hmm. What were the relationships then between Genesis Lending and Genesis Trading, Genesis Lending Trading and the rest of the digital currency group empire? How much does that actually matter at the end of the day? And are some of these questions not just a matter of, you know, customer money tied up in one exchange or one lender, but is there a broader systemic issue here in the way customer funds are being used among crypto companies more largely as it comes to lending and trading activities? 
Okay, so one that we continue to ask questions on and of course cast no aspersions but continue to dig deep as you do with all the relative, uh, really tentacles of this business. We thank you, Shanali Basak. Meanwhile, coming up, we want to talk a little bit about FIFA, the backlash going viral on day two of the World Cup. This is Bloomberg. In 2010, FIFA announced that Qatar would host the 2022 World Cup. In its bid, the country promised to make it a carbon-neutral tournament. But as the matches approach, environmentalists are claiming that Qatar has greenwashed the World Cup and that the event will put millions of megatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that claim is mostly a PR play. Uh, essentially, there is no way that a mega event of that size can be carbon neutral. FIFA can do better and should do better. And, and you know, my focus would be on uh, encouraging them to do that for the next World Cup. The UN defines carbon neutrality, or achieving net zero carbon emissions, as balancing a measured amount of carbon released with an equal amount offset. First step is to measure your emissions. And so that's what FIFA has done for the World Cup. We looked into that calculation and we think that this is quite significantly underestimated. So there's two big challenges with any carbon neutrality claim at an event of this size. The first one is travel. And the second part of this is construction. 75% of the carbon footprint of all sports stadia over their entire lifetime is locked in on day one from the materials they're built from. It's not about operating costs, it's about concrete and steel. Qatar has invested billions of dollars in infrastructure for the tournament, including building seven new stadiums. Organizers estimate that the World Cup will emit 3.6 megatons of carbon dioxide. The construction of the stadium is uh, the most problematic element because it's the element that we think was most massively underestimated. From that factor, we think the total footprint would be 5 million tons. International flights in and out of Doha will account for the majority of emissions. However, organizers argue that this World Cup will be more energy efficient than others, since fans won't have to fly to different venues and can instead just take public transit. The sticking point is always the flights. Most Olympics and World Cups, it accounts to more than 85% of total emissions. Balancing carbon emissions with offsets is key to carbon neutrality. So far, Qatar has purchased less than 350,000 carbon offset credits of the 3.6 million needed in their estimation. The Supreme Committee says that it has already secured a minimum of 1.5 million credits from the Global Carbon Council and that further details will be forthcoming. So far, greenwashing issues are not keeping fans from rooting for their teams on the pitch. An estimated 1.7 million people will be in attendance, with over 3 million tickets sold. But with a warmer future ahead, effects on fans will soon be felt. Sport is, is the most enormous opportunity to tackle the climate crisis because we can engage football fans and make them fans of the environment through, through their favourite sport. Now going viral, let's stick with FIFA, let's stick with seven national football teams, including England, who will not wear a rainbow armband, showing solidarity with LGBTQ plus rights, bowing instead to pressure from FIFA because players might receive a yellow card for the show of support. Qatar has been under intense scrutiny leading up to the World Cup, of course, over, of course, the treatment of migrant workers, as well as concerns over human rights and its criminalization of homosexuality. Now, one gay rights group, Stonewall, says that by threatening sporting sanctions and stopping players from wearing the One Love armbands, FIFA are brushing criticism of human rights abuses under the carpet. Human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell noted, look, two days ago, FIFA president spoke of inclusivity about this ruling, shows actually his true colours. I urge the team captains at their post-match post conferences to spend just 30 seconds to speak out for the rights of women, LGBTs and migrant workers. That would have a huge impact, he says. Ed, for me also, the Iranian team not singing their national anthem and of course over the course right. of this weekend going viral, that shocking news out of Colorado Springs, it makes it a very intense time for the LGBTQ plus community, particularly in the US. Yeah, and we see on social media it's having an impact on the armbands, you know, captains saying that they thought that they would face a fine rather than something relating to kit rather than a sporting sanction, serious things. 
Uh, that does it, Caroline, for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Tuesday, though, we've got Zoom CFO Kelly Steckelberg to discuss earnings and the growing competition in video conferencing. Don't forget, check out our podcast. You can find it on the terminal as well as on Apple, Spotify and on iHeart. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.